Good evening. Welcome into the Illinois Enquirer podcast live at State Farm Center after Illinois falls to produce 77 to 71. It's Jeremy Warner, Derek Piper. Uh, what a crowd tonight. What, what a atmosphere. This is one of the best atmospheres I think Derek and I have covered. I'm thinking about this, Derek, now. Um, eight years, I think eight seasons we've covered this team. And this felt like a big-time atmosphere of, of Illinois being very, very relevant again. But Purdue is even more relevant. They looked phenomenal. They looked final four good in the second half. Zach Eady, 28 points, too much for Illinois to handle one-on-one. So Illinois doubles him in the second half. And boy, the other guys. The shooters went off. It produced eight for 10 from three after going one for six from three in the first half. Clutch threes down the stretch from everybody. It felt like Lance Jones hit one, Braden Smith. What a great shot with a 20 seconds left. Fletcher Lawyer, 12 of his 16 points in the second half. Mason Gillis hit a couple big threes as well, Derek. Uh, in Illinois, not as good offensively uh, against Purdue. Purdue with Zach Eady back there seemed to bother Terrence Shannon and Marcus Damask and Coleman Hawkins at times tonight. But what's your main takeaway is Purdue outscores Illinois 43-31 to 31 to overcome a six-point halftime deficit. Uh, biggest takeaway is Purdue's legit for sure. Uh, not that I questioned it, but that's the closing ability of like a Final Four team, the ability to make those threes and just to put you in the bind of do you double Eady, do you not? When you Early in the second half, I know – latter portions of the first into the second half, he was starting to get his, especially on Coleman. And then uh, you make the decision to double him. And then right off the bat, boom, boom, Smith makes a three, then Lawyer makes a three. So uh, it, it's really that it's really that tough decision that makes Purdue uh, one of the top offensive machines in the country. Uh, but really, defensively, you can't really sleep on them either because they're top 25 defense in Illinois just bogged down in the, in the half court offensively. I felt like, especially with Terrence having a, a slow night or just one where he has the first bucket of the game and only makes two field goals the rest of the way. So uh, I think it's, it's painful for Illinois to have played close competitive games with teams that are going to be seated higher than them and in a one seed in Purdue, a potential one seed at worst two seed in Tennessee. And then Marquette, who's I think sitting on the two line right now. So uh, without that marquee win, it's probably going to be hard to get into that three seed line. I, I would imagine they mo more than likely don't make it. They'll probably be uh, a four uh, if they win at Iowa, and, and we'll see where that thing goes here. But uh, I think that as of right now, the likelihood is is pretty – I don't know, the odds are pretty high that they're going to be in that four or five line, which a lot of people wanted to dodge. But uh, because you don't want to see a, a like team in the second round, you definitely don't want to see a, a one seed in the Sweet 16. Can this team beat – a one seed they can but um yeah. they, they've just come up short for one reason or another and i know that brad's dying about the the loose balls and the rebounds and whatnot so uh, i thought it was a good effort thought it was electric crowd that this this place when you give them a top-notch game it, it it rocks so uh that that was cool but yeah a disappointing one for illinois knowing that they especially you know, they led for all but like 40 seconds in the first half so uh let one slip yeah, led for 29 minutes in this game. Uh, and I think it shows Illinois is capable of competing against these top teams. I mean, to go to Tennessee and compete like they did, I think show that they're capable of, of giving a run to a number one seed in the Sweet 16, right? Like they've shown that time after time with Purdue, these two games and Marquette. Um, obviously, Coleman Hawkins not quite right that game with the injury. And he still says that knee is bothering. Seemed like it did a, a little bit tonight. But these team teams are deserving of the seating that they're at right now. Like Purdue is a one seed. Like that is what a national title contender looks like. And Derek, I would not be shocked if they did the Virginia thing, lose to a 16 seed one year and come back and win the whole dang thing. They are capable of doing it because Zach Eady is one of the best players we've ever seen in college basketball. I know he's seven foot four and that helps him a lot, but he's really skilled. He's smart. Um, and he was great. Like he made the right decisions, missed some shots actually. Uh, 28 points on 23 shots isn't the worst for Illinois. But then those they got the, the supporting cast around him. Like Braden Smith is way better than he was last year. Fletcher Lawyer has had struggles this year, but we see what he's capable of. And Lance Jones was a, a great addition, didn't have a great night, but hit one big three. And Mason Gillis is just kind of that veteran guy bigger version of Jacob Grandison, maybe a little bit, but um, this team is capable of going all the way. And Illinois hasn't shown that ability, like because they haven't won these type of games. But if if they got a better game from Terrence Shannon tonight, if they get a couple of those loose balls late, 
know, the one where Lance Jones caught the three, we just went back and reviewed some of these plays. Um, the one where Lance Jones caught the three, that was just bad luck and a seven foot four guy grabbing a, a rebound because Braden Smith made a bad pass. Justin Harmon tipped it, goes off the glass. That's just bad luck and steps into a three there. Um, Braden Smith, that shot was ridiculous. Like that, that was a ridiculous step in shot against Terrence Chan, who probably could have been up more, probably should have known what the, the clock was at there, but there's some big shots. But I, so I, I, I tip my cap and I, I think Edie's presence really bothered them. It's, it seemed that way. I know that Brad mentioned in the post game that it seemed like Purdue was was taking away the three ball for the most part. Uh, I know that if you would have went into this game knowing that Hawkins against Edie and, and wanting that matchup of Illinois, wanting the spacing to where Edie has to guard Coleman, that you'd expect him to take more than one three point attempt. And really, it was like a thirty foot heave early in a shot clock that uh, wasn't a good shot. So uh, that was only. His only attempt from beyond the arc. Only on the night was cold from deep four threes on I think sixteen attempts. So that was something that was a little bit surprising. But uh, Purdue was able to, with the way the Edie's hovering around the basket, kind of deter Illinois from being aggressive and going at him. I thought there were times where they maybe could have attacked him a little bit more um, assertively and and just forced the issue on whether it was going to be a foul or, or make force Edie to make the play. Uh, there was only a handful of times that Illinois was able to really do that. So uh, down the stretch, there was a little bit of, I think, hesitancy, lack of flow. Illinois is a is a matchup hunting offense, but without the matchups that, that it was kind of searching for, it, it just seemed to stagnate some on the perimeter. Weren't running a, a lot for Shannon. Weren't able to get Shannon in kind of that kill mode down the stretch. It was mostly Marcus doing his thing and uh, a lot of other – just kind of stagnation uh, for Illinois offensively. So uh, I don't have as big of a problem with – I know that you, you give up the offensive rebounds you do. You don't get the, the crunch time stops. It, to me, it, and this is going to sound new because we've been talking defense for a month and a half, it feels like. It, it was offensively, I think, that let yep. the game slip. Uh, not having the, the answers at that end when Purdue is going to get some of those, like you said, lucky bounces that or just hustle plays that lead to threes. Uh, I thought Illinois, on, on the whole, had pretty good intensity uh, defensively. It was just offensively couldn't make enough plays. Yeah, and I thought, uh, you know, they brought some energy and effort on, on the glass. I mean, he's going to get his. Uh, but those late ones, the, those late ones are, are really what killed you. But, yeah, when you make one of ten shots against a Purdue offense that is even better or as good as your offense, Derek, like – they just have so many answers. Uh, it's pick your poison, and, and they made you pay when you doubled the ED because at some point you had to. We're all sitting there going, the crush behind us is saying, Coleman can't guard him. Nobody can guard him <laughs> straight up one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. And I thought in the first half they kind of kept him on his toes. They doubled. They digged. They did get a couple turnovers on him, and Coleman had a nice block. Terrence had a nice you know, kind of impacted at the rim for a couple. I, I thought they did a decent job on him, but when, when the other guys shoot like that, it's just – you got to keep up with it. And, and Illinois' offense for once tonight was not able to keep up with it. And I thought a big reason for that, and Matt Painter said this a lot, Purdue kept them out of transition. Uh, Illinois wasn't able to push the ball in transition. Illinois had two fast break points tonight. And that's part of why Terrence Shannon struggled. 11 points, 3 for 13 shooting. He was 0 for 4 from 3 tonight. Uh, hurt his forearm wrist on his shooting hand, his left hand, uh, later in the game. But you know, Brad Underwood said he had zero defensive rebounds, and that's going to impact – Terrence, because usually the best fast breaks for Terrence are when he gets the rebound, pushes it in transition, and people struggle to pick him up. So uh, I thought that was a big part of that offensive stagnation too, Derek, is they're not as good in the half court as they are in the fast break, even though they're pretty good in the in the half court with Marcus Damask. But Damask 8-16 of tonight, which is good. Uh, a lot of that came late. But I thought Edie just impacted a lot of, of what they could do with Marcus and that booty ball too. That's a good point. Yeah, and with just all this you have to send at the defensive glass, too, to try to come up with those defensive rebounds, it does lead, uh, take away some of the leak outs you might have uh, in transition. And uh, I know that Painter was really emphasizing the, the lack of turnovers. Uh, they had a couple, but uh, not a lot of live ball opportunities to really get out and run. So uh, that's something where Illinois doesn't force turnovers uh, really throughout the the course of the last few seasons, they're towards the bottom of the country in doing that. So that can be a situation that doesn't lead to those fast break opportunities. So uh, I think that, you know, Braden Smith, well, I thought that Terrence did a great job 
defensively on Braden Smith for the whole for mo- for the most part of the game, especially in the first half. Smith was on Shannon, and I, while you'd think that hey, that's a a good size mismatch, and maybe Shannon can score over him or, or through him on off the dribble, uh, they were able to to really cut off some driving lanes, and uh, just didn't feel like Illinois was able to to get him downhill and in a rhythm. So um, certainly the the fast break is an area where it's easy offense for him, but things didn't come easy enough for Shannon and uh, just, just couldn't, couldn't have a night. So uh, I, I do think it's, it's interesting. Like Quincy had it going, although it felt like Quincy wasn't even seeing the guy in front of him. Cause he, he almost had like eye to eye two threes where someone's right in his face. Like that looks like a horrible shot. And he makes three of your four threes uh, on the night, but doesn't play a ton down the stretch. And uh, I thought Dane had some moments, uh, but didn't play a lot late. So, um, but just kind of yeah. things that you can kind of rehash. I know that people are always talking rotations, especially in a late game that doesn't go your way. Well, let's bring that up because I do think it's worth bringing up. Uh, Quincy Garrier, great first half, just confident, Derek. Like, we haven't seen that confidence from him, not only shooting the ball, but driving. He got a guard on him. He'd actually drive the ball. Haven't seen a lot of that. Uh, wasn't great from the free throw line tonight. But just nine minutes in the second half. Ty Rogers, eight minutes in the second half. And he had six points and three rebounds during that time. Justin Harmon in the second half, 11 minutes, 0 of 2 shooting, 1 rebound. Uh, Luke Goody in the second half, 11 minutes, and he didn't record a stat besides a foul. Like, those I thought were interesting. Like, Danger, 0 minutes in in the second half. What what did you make of that? He heard his case with the turnovers. uh, He had a couple of those after a fast start. I mean, he was shot out of a cannon right off the bat. He strips Zach Eady on the defensive end and gets an offensive rebound and one. Uh, there at the other end right off the bat, but uh, a couple over dribble attempts uh, on back downs and steps on the sideline too. And uh, But I, I think that I thought Illinois' best job of handling Zach physically in the first half was Dane and Quincy kind of walling up on him. And uh, yeah, I know that the crush were mad about the one-on-one matches with Coleman, but uh, he can't do a whole lot there. But yeah, I thought Dane gave decent minutes outside of the turnovers, uh, but that, that does hurt you. And I think also when you're trying to to get that spacing, that's something that, you know, Edie was already a problem around the basket tonight. When Dane's down there, it's it's something that you're not going to be able to to run away from. Zach's not going to step outside of the cylinder, essentially. So uh, there was that. Harmon had a, a tough night on the whole. Um, I, I think that Quincy was probably the, the one that was the more head-scratching decision, not putting him out there late, knowing that Didn't he play the final six minutes. Quincy didn't play the final six minutes. Rogers didn't play the final nine minutes. Yeah, I know Quincy made, missed a couple free throws tonight. Um, I don't, I don't know exactly what was leading to the idea to, to bench him. I know that shortly after he went out, I think Illinois went on like a six zero or six zero run or something like that. So maybe Brad just liked the lineup, but uh, it didn't seem like Luke was giving you a ton. I know that he was, he was playing hard, but you know that's something that without the three ball, it, what do you, what are you getting versus what are you giving up? So. Uh, and then Ty, you wonder, although Ty was active on the offensive glass in particular, you know, when you're thinking loose balls and, and securing those late game 50-50 chances, Ty, that's something Ty really thrives at. So maybe you look back and say, well, that might be a guy we would have liked to have out there. But um, offensively, there are the the limitations, obviously. So right. uh, easy Just, hindsight, but I, I especially – I thought Quincy would have been out there. That was a little surprising to me. Yeah, especially with the confidence he had. Like, I get it with Ty because offensively you need a points there. And, and if you have Ty out there, Edie can just sit in that paint for the most part in college basketball without the three-second rule. Um, I do think Coleman battled tonight, man. Uh, eight defensive rebounds was awesome by him tonight. He had three steals, you know, 13 points. He didn't get a lot. Uh, obviously, he didn't make a three. only shot one of them. I thought they could have exploited that a little bit more when Edie was on him, but – I thought he was really good tonight. You saw Marcus do that, but you can't beat a team with like Purdue with Terrence Shannon Jr. having an off night. Like, and that's why Quincy was so big in that first half was because he kind of allowed you to have a lead despite Terrence getting in foul trouble and all that. But it seems simple, but you just need better. And uh, is it the rebounding? Was it just an off shooting night? I don't know. I think Terrence Shannon's going to have great nights most nights, Derek, but you can't beat a team like Purdue with, with Shannon not being a star. Yeah, not going to happen for the most part. I mean, it, it does say something that you were able to be up 10 on them without it. Uh, and then um, it, it's like you said, spoke to Quincy and, and some of the other efforts you're getting from other guys, Coleman, uh, Dane off the bench, 
Damask was really good in the first half, kind of had a lull there early to middle part of the second, but got going down, down the stretch. So uh, I, I just would look at this and probably evaluate a little bit, just say, hey, we got we to gotta maybe run some actions to try to get him. I, I know Brad likes to say we don't run a lot through Terrence and whatnot. And I'd say that you, you try to d- draw something up for him and it's going to get you a basket. I thought that early they ran some staggers for him off the ball to get him coming towards the top of the key. Uh, it's just, you know, Braden Smith did a good job of, of staying in front. But uh, that's something where – I'd like to see that, you know, you know, you're going to play offense through Damask and get him in booty ball and, and whatnot, but can, can you do something as far as a scheme or as far as a, a set to get Terrence a bucket to try to click him back into place? It was as Illinois kind of bogged down. I, there were a couple of possessions. I'm wondering, you know, what are they running? What are they, what are they doing with the stagnation on the perimeter? Um, that was one thing that kind of stuck out late. I'd be interested to go back and see just kind of what that looked like. All right, here's Brad Underwood. I asked him about these close losses to really great teams, and, and here was his response. You've played some of the best teams in the country, Tennessee, Marquette, and Purdue twice. What do you hope your guys take away from it? What do you hope you learn from it? Yeah, just what I said, little plays. It's a little plays. I mean, when, you, when, you, when you get a stop and you got three guys around the ball and nobody even makes an attempt to get on the floor for it, those, go, those send you home. You know, life's, and I told them, it's winning and losing. And, and, and there's winners and losers in life, and, and you, you can't not go make those plays. And, uh, you know, we've got to get them to understand the, the urgency of the end, the abruptness of the end. If you do it, you know, uh, you don't do it, you go home. And, you know, we have a loose ball, just an unfortunate bounce. You know, they make a, I thought they made a, not a very smart play. And the Jones kid shot it really quick, and we make a great defensive play, and the ball bats up in the air, and they come up with it, and it leads to a three. Uh, but uh, again, you just we just we just have to rebound the basketball better and, and come up with those loose balls, and um, those were those were defining moments in the game that they made. They made us pay for every one of them. Yeah, again, I'm, I'm more tipping my cap um, to Purdue. I, I just thought they were phenomenal in the second half. And I, I just think they're a better team than Illinois with ED and all those guys around them getting even better. But um, I, I agree with Brad of, of getting those, but I also think Ty Rogers is probably a guy who can get some of those, though he give up some on the offense. And as you said, Derek, I, I think I'd rather have Quincy Garrier with the way he was playing than, than Luke Goody at, at the end of the game with the way he's been playing here recently. So I think they got to figure out some of those late game things too of, how can you get going? Kudos to them. They went on that 6-0 run, keyed by Marcus, uh, to, to get back into the game and tie it and had some chances to take the lead. But uh, to get some of those plays, you got to have the guys on the court that that will get those. Um, and, and as much as Luke Hustle is, it's just he's not as big or as athletic or as quick as, as Quincy Garrier. Yeah, probably two best rebounders in Ty and, and Quincy, especially when Quincy's dialed in. And uh, I thought for the most part he, he played pretty well tonight um certainly made the threes which stuck it stuck out but uh his energy was was ramped up a little bit more tonight than what we've seen of late so uh those are grown man type of plays that you need to have happen sometimes it's just not going to go your way sometimes the bounce of the ball or just the the way it goes where you know Harmon swats that one off the backboard and it, it ends up in Edie's hands for a kick out three in the corner and uh, you can't really do a whole lot about that one but there are some other ones out there that you certainly wonder where, where Gillis is chasing down boards and and whatnot, just to to be able to make those those rebounding plays to, to end the game. So um, Quincy and 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 Ty, I know you're going to always have the question about Ty whether you trust his free throw shooting late or you just do you have the offensive spacing you want when he's on the court. But there there is a give and take there, so uh, that's something that you have to evaluate if you're definitely talking about loose balls because those guys can definitely go get some. All right, Derek, this is, sets up a, a big game, uh, obviously, at Iowa uh, because it's a huge game for Iowa. They have a week off uh, leading into the final regular season game here, Sunday night, 6 o'clock tip-off. So it's a long wait. Um, first of all, I guess, what do you think the, the week of practice is going to be like for Illinois after this one? Because Brad was really harping um, about the, those those plays. So I think this will get in their heads about this. But, you know, I, 
I was going to be the more motivated team. I mean, I still wants to get the number two seed in the big 10 tournament. Does that matter a ton? I don't know. Do they want to fall to the five seed line? Probably not, but uh, you are going to get an Iowa team that is desperate for this win because they're sitting straight on the bubble. If they get a quad one win over a top 15 team, they're probably going into the big 10 tournament with um, maybe on the right side of the bubble, meaning maybe one more win uh, to clinch this all. So uh, it's going to be really interesting to see how, how Illinois comes out with this game because these are the ones you got to win, man. Um, these are, these are the, you're a better team than Iowa, but uh, this is kind of the team you might see in the first or second round. For sure. Yeah. I think that Brad is just going to probably emphasize urgency and, and that it has to be now. And you got to clean up any kind of mistake that's out there or, or play that's you know left out there. There's, a locker room full of guys. You got a loaded senior night for a reason because not many guys from this team are coming back next year. So, like, the, this is the last run, and you can't have it be a, a loose ball here or a missed assignment here or what have it to, to prevent this team from going where maybe they should go or can go. So, uh, I'm sure he's going to drive that home and, and try to get that the toughness plays. Can't have any of that. Uh, I would probably see him challenge the fact that, that – I know it's easy when you're playing the number two team in the country in front of an electric environment, but this team had more juice defensively tonight than they have a lot pretty much through the, the last month or six weeks. Uh, number one, you got to carry that with you to, to Iowa where they can really score. It, that's got to be a non-negotiable. That's got to be something that Illinois brings the rest of the way because the guarantees after Iowa, obviously you get one at the Big Ten tournament that, at the very least and then one in the NCAA tournament, but uh, anything after that is is up in the air. So. Uh, I think that's things that he'll he'll look at and, and just try to get his team's attention. Um, but certainly, uh, I think also just you you want to sure up some late game stuff. You, you got to be able to address you know what do we want to get into offensively. Uh, like I said, can you can you run something for Terrence to get him a look? Uh, because this has been a team that uh, I know that they were able to close late game against Iowa, uh, close well enough against Minnesota late game. But you've had some. You know, Purdue, this game is a one-possession game, one way or the other, the final four minutes. Uh, Nebraska, obviously, you, you could have easily lost that game. Michigan State, Penn State, there's some opportunities they always kind of let, let slide and, and maybe not made, made them enough plays late. Uh, you could probably even rope in Marquette in, in that one if you want to go all the way back. So uh, just, yeah. just having that figured out. Yeah, and then you've had, you know, games, so I, I want to be fair, like the Wisconsin game where you have guys step up and make big plays, like, like Marcus Damask. Like, True. He, he's the guy, man, that's that's been really stepping up. Uh, I don't know if he's the most vocal leader, but he, he wants the ball. Uh, I mean, he's all Big Ten first team for me. But, you know, those moments, I thought Coleman, you know, played really, really well tonight. But that's just where you guys here in Shan's got to take over and – got to make the right moves as coaching staff and you got to make those plays and they just have to do that a little bit more consistently against these these great teams that they haven't all right we'll, we'll come back we'll get some of your questions if you got any super chats we'll love those we'll answer some of your questions here coming up but first i want to talk about one of our great sponsors it's factor eating better is easy with factors delicious ready to eat meals every fresh never frozen meal is chef crafted dietitian approved and ready to go in just two minutes you'll have over 35 different options to choose from every week including calorie smart protein plus and keto also there are more than 60 add-ons to help you stay fueled up and feeling good all day long so what are you waiting for get started today and get after your goals the best part is these are two minute meals you can fuel up fast with factors restaurant quality meals they're ready to eat and heat wherever you are. They got pancakes, smoothies, more. Uh, I love the Protein Plus. You get your chicken and all these delicious uh, flavors with that. Discover a wide variety of easy options for the entire day, like breakfast, midday bites, and more. And no prep, no mess meals. Factor meals are ready to heat and eat, so there's no prepping, cooking, or cleanup needed. So head to factormeals.com slash Illini50 and use code Illini50 to get 50% off. That's code Illini50 at factormeals.com slash Illini50 to get 50% off. All right, Derek, let's get some of these questions before we get out of here. Uh, Dylan. Dylan says, Underwood unable to drop any plays to get Shannon or Coleman a three. Imagine that. I love how, like, you beat Wisconsin. Underwood's really great. He's in the Big Ten Coach of the Year running, and then you lose to the number three team in the country, and all of a sudden he's he's not good. Like, there's there's criticism here. But, yeah, Coleman attacked off the, the bounce really well, but I, I just thought Purdue, when you got Zach Eady back there, Derek, 
they can run you off the, the three point line like Illinois really likes to do. Only Edie's better at protecting the rim than anybody in the Big Ten. Yeah, you could say one of the criticisms also is just Illinois maybe didn't attack as confidently or as aggressively inside the arc. I thought there were times where Coleman maybe could have hit, you know, hit a runner or pulled up or or even just gone into Zach Eady and, and tried to force the contact and and see what the, the ref was gonna do, make him make a decision. So uh there was some of that too. Um I do think that it seemed whether you want to blame, I don't think it's it's probably it's probably some of both. Like it just seemed like Coleman or it just seemed like Terrence was kind of just out there for a, a large stretch of the second half and wasn't that involved in in actions or or getting downhill or anything. So was Illinois not running enough for him? Was Terrence not taking enough assertiveness and just saying, give me the ball type of things where you expect a all American player um, last game in Champaign to, to go do that. Um, so that, that those are some things that I think you probably have some shared blame and, uh, but yeah, certainly they've they've had some games where they have closed and have gotten that thing done. But um, it is to to cycle back. Of course, it's easier for Terrence to to get when you get a stop, you get a run out and open floor thing, and that's that's where he's un, unstoppable. But uh, what can they do to address that uh, of him getting downhill in the paint, drawing drawing collapses when then you can kick for three and everything? That's that's what wasn't there tonight. Yeah, they weren't comfortable attacking AD. You're you're right. Like some of those runners, they didn't want to take the mid range game. Uh, I thought Domask was the best at it. I mean, he took a couple right at AD. That was yep. really really impressive. And you know, sometimes you can draw fouls uh, on him doing that. And I didn't think they did a really good job of that. But other times, AD's going to just influence a shot or, or, or shove it right back in your face. Um, so yeah, it's it's not easy um, going up against him, but. Uh, Justin Harmon had one where didn't he pass to somebody? It was Hansberry and they shot a three. Like, can't do that. Like Harmon, that's, that's gotta be your shot. Um, they passed to Hansberry late in the shot clock. Jasmine, this game was nearly a carbon copy of the Marquette game. Play a good team tough, then eventually lose. And she says, Illinois is not beating a current AP top 25 team all year. Now that's true. Partly because the big 10 does not have any ranked team. So you didn't get a lot of opportunities, but that's the question about this team. Like Illinois should win their first round game over a 12 or 13 seed. We know that's not guaranteed. You got to bring it. And uh, I feel like, you know, against four or five seeds, it's going to be a toss-up game, but this team is not showing that it, it can beat one of the top 10 teams uh, in the country. That's for sure. Right. That's still a big question. Um, are they the Ford Atlantic was ranked at the time, right? Yes. They yeah. aren't that good. That, that hasn't aged as well, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> uh, Michigan State, when you beat them um, – you wish that would have aged better. So uh, I, I think we're all not necessarily wondering, is this team capable of it? Because we know that they are. It's just, I think mostly it hurts them in terms of the the resume. Like that's where it's hard for not getting tonight, especially 10 point lead on your home floor against this caliber team. You talk about the three seed and how much more favorable that path could have been. When you look at some of those teams ahead of you, I mean, I, I think, you know, Baylor, I think has four wins against top 10 teams in the net and Creighton has a win at home against UConn. And, and there are some other teams that are higher up in the pecking order that you're, you're looking to maybe jump that have some of those more quad one, a type of wins where Illinois best win right now is at Wisconsin, a team that is a six seed right now. And uh, since Shannon's return, they've only beaten two tournament teams, but some of that is the big 10 for sure that hasn't provided those opportunities. But uh, this was one that you could have maybe controlled and, and been able to, uh, to secure it would have been huge in terms of that three seed because you know it's easier in terms of the second round three versus yep. six much more favorable and then avoiding the one as long as possible saint dominic what's up dom he's been a little chiller feels like lately uh he said we need another dominant big man like kofi why can't they get one of those derek I mean, he's one of the best big men in illinois history yeah like, Edie is a cheat code kofi was a cheat code for for all those years um now they do present some problems when you can only play a certain way with those guys, but it's really good when they're that good. It's hard to find Kofi Coburn. It's hard to find Zach Edes. I mean, Matt Painter does a pretty good job of finding these guys over and over again, but Isaac Haas wasn't quite Zach Eady, right? Like um, he wasn't close. Matt Harms wasn't close, but Coleman Hawkins is one of the best big men uh, in the big 10. It's a different kind of big man, uh, but he has been one of the best ones in the big 10. So yeah, you'd love another Kofi Coburn. They're just hard to find, Eric, and hard to develop. Yeah, and it is it is a good reminder, though. You know, sometimes narratives get 
they change, get convenient. It's like, oh, you know, life after Kofi's actually be better for Illinois, which it hasn't been bad. It hasn't, no. but it's. It, I'm not. I don't think him leaving made things better. But just uh, think, this could have been Kofi's fifth year senior year, I'm and he could have made millions. Oh, I, I was just thinking this. about that. That matchup tonight between him and, and Edie would have been fantastic. But uh, yeah, I mean, those type of guys are are generational in, in a sense. I know, like you said, Purdue's done a good job. You know, Swanigan uh, a number of years ago, they, they've had some good ones. But Juwan Kofi, Johnson was nasty. Juwan Johnson was really, really good. So uh, pretty good one in the building tonight, Merez. I don't, I don't know, you know, probably more of a, a defense and rebounding guy early than offensive juggernaut, uh, throw it on the block type of guy. But, um, yeah, Kofi's, Kofi Coburn's don't grow on trees. Um, that's the reason <laughs> Illinois had never had one before. Yeah, I like the future of the front court. If Imani and Merez are going to be here for a while, I think those guys are going to be pretty dang good. Um, and develop a guy like Jax, they are probably going to get a transfer stretch kind of guy um, or a versatile forward. So they got a lot of work to do in the offseason, but I, I, I don't want to get to that conversation yet. But uh, my questions are more about shooting and scoring next year, how they're going to acquire that. But they, that. That's for another day. Derek and I are already talking about what April and May are going to look like with potentially <sighs> seven newcomers. <laughs> Stressing no me out. Stressing off. me out thinking about it. Yep. Yeah, we'll yeah, get there. Uh, we'll get there. Almighty Finn, why is Edie allowed to go over the back every time? He doesn't have to go over the back. He just reaches his hand up and <laughs> taps it back. I know. <laughs> and by the way, over the back is not a foul. It's a push. Oh, yeah. Like that over the back is not actually in the rule book from what I understand. Interesting. But re referees can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's more of a push foul. He got called for – like the ones he got called for tonight didn't feel like they were great <laughs> on him. Um, so I thought Illinois like got, actually benefited from some of those, but some of them, you know, he's just huge, man. Like that, he's just – he's just a freak. Yeah. And he's gotten so much more skilled over the last two years. Like that's why Purdue is so dang good is – He's one of the most unique players we've ever seen. Right. No, no doubt about it. And, I mean, just his ability to dominate the glass uh, probably is underrated how he's gotten better defensively uh, because he is able to to be around the rim a lot and, and move his feet a little bit better than when he did come in first. And uh, and then, yeah, I mean, just the will you or won't you decision. It, it happened right after – or it happened early in the second half, but also – I think it was the 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 lawyer three right for the runner over Harmon. Illinois doubles. He kicks it to Smith in the corner. Harmon has to then rotate over, and then lawyer ends up making that three. So uh, when Purdue's shooting that three ball, which is was a knock on them last year, they shot yeah. like around low thirties from three. Uh, this year they're one of the better three point shooting teams out there. So that complement with a, a dominant force like that is is why you have one of the historically great offenses uh, on paper in terms of efficiency and everything like that. So they're, yeah. they're tough. They're tough. Well, M Mark said, don't need to hear any more love for Purdue right now. Heard more than enough from uh, Hummel is his name and Bardo as they should. They're, they're really guys. They're just really good. Like they, yeah. they're deserving of, of all of this. Like they're just really tough to cover and they're, they're a better team than Illinois. It doesn't mean Illinois can't have a success, successful March either. But uh, I, I think this team's better, produced better than they were last year. I, I don't see them losing in, in the first weekend. It's just they got answers, man. And those those sophomore guards have just gotten a lot better. And Lance Jones has given something that they didn't have last year. So um, they're good. And, and they deserve the, that kind of kudos. It's where it would have been nice to have some closing plays. Um, that's where Illinois is a little bit different than – like. That, talk about missing Kofi. It would have been nice to have Io out there in the final four, four minutes. That's the thing. It's a little bit of a different. It's interesting. I, we could start a whole podcast. Do you have Io or Terrence Shannon? Um, I'm not trying to to make a case one way or the other. But one thing hey. with Io's teams was it always seemed like they, they won those games. It always yes. seemed like they won those in the balance games late. Where that's one thing where Shannon and then this team in general, obviously hasn't come through enough not saying it can't yeah. happen but that's what's one thing io runs offense i was more of a natural leader like he's the alpha uh terrence isn't always that guy he's the alpha in the way he plays on the court um and he's more physically imposing right like he's more of a bull in a china shop in transition than i was like graceful um yeah. and fast but we're seeing what i was doing at the at the next level like 
uh, he's one of the best. He's a, he's a better player in my opinion than Terrence Shannon Jr. But um, yeah, they just do things a little bit differently. But I, I would take Io o- over him because I think Io is just more naturally at this level, Derek, the that guy. While, while Terrence, I think, plays off people really. Like he's an um, like Terrence is a number one. He's a, he's an all American, yeah, right. right? But like he kind of plays off to mask. And I think that's better for him than even last year when he played off of, of Matthew Meyer. Uh, and I think that's what makes him dangerous, but he's, he's more reliant uh, on transition. Like I was a much better half court player uh, in my opinion, but I, I do think we should give Terrence a ton of credit what he's done defensively over the last month and a half. Yes. He's been by far their best defender. And I thought he really bothered Braden Smith in the first half. And then Braden got going because Braden might be a first team all big 10 player too. He's um, among the best point guards in, in the big 10. And that includes Boo Booey and, and Jameer Young. So uh, I, I do think Shannon is, is played unbelievably well uh, since returning from suspension, especially the last, what, eight games or so. Um, yeah. I mean, we're, we're splitting hairs on some of the all time yeah. greats here. If, if, if Terrence does get that all America honors, his, his Jersey will be in the rafters, right? It's a good stretch to, uh, to have those guys that aren't, are you know 20 years apart uh to talk about so uh yeah defensively i mean outside of those first handful of games that terrence came back maybe first five or six he's had a stellar defensive season and probably more impactful defensively than io was his final year io obviously kicked it up a notch a few notches in the, in the nba uh we've, we've we had seen what he was capable of uh but you know, he really bought into that role and you always knew he would in terms of whatever it took to get on the court and win. But uh, yeah, that's probably a, a conversation for another time uh, evaluating the all time grades. But uh, it is something that came to mind and it's still something, you know, if this team's going to go on that that run, it might be yeah. something where it, not that there's anything wrong with putting the ball into mass hands and and making it happen. But tonight, Illinois really could have used a little more assertive and effective Shannon down the stretch. Yeah, no, um, these He's a heck of a player. Just didn't have a great night tonight. Uh, let's see. Before we wrap up here, fly line, I fly. The term bad matchup gets thrown around a lot. Purdue is a really bad matchup for us and most every other team in the country. Sorry, too much Purdue love here. I mean, yeah. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Zach Eady is a bad matchup for anybody. And then the other guy shot well. Like, the other guys made big shots. Um, so I, I actually like making those guys beat you. They beat you. Uh, once you started double team, and I thought it was a good adjustment. Like we talk about adjustments, I thought it was a good adjustment to double Zach Eadies. He was kind of killing you early in that first half, and then Lance Jones, Braden Smith, and Fletcher Warrior, and Mason Gillis made shots. There are very, very few, if any, teams that can live with one on one in the post with Zach and, and make it palatable. And I Illinois for a while, you know, Zach was missing some shots, and on the whole, like like, like you said, twenty three shots to get twenty eight points. Like you'll live with that probably any day of the week uh, with Zach, with Zach Eady. But uh, I do think they excel at some areas that really are Illinois' pressure points defensively. Like, uh, although Braden Smith didn't on the whole, like just go off on you. I thought he might because of his, he's so good in pick and roll on ball screen. Illinois struggled with that. Eady on, on post-ups, Illinois with Coleman, it's not his strength. So uh, there are a couple of those things that you wonder about, but uh, I thought Illinois would do more to them offensively than they than they did in terms of their success rate, especially in the second half. So in terms of the offense, it didn't, you know, you, if you would have told me Purdue score 77, I thought there'd be a pretty good chance that Illinois yeah. won the game. Um, it, it was well, more I looked at you at halftime. I looked at you at halftime and said, I think Illinois scoring 80. Yeah. Because, I mean, they had 40 at the time, but it just, right. it just felt like Purdue didn't have an answer for Illinois' offense in that first half, despite Shannon not getting out in transition. So um, kudos – Kudos to Purdue and, and Illinois needs to, to work on that. I mean, we were wondering what they would look like when they have an off offensive night, and, and this is what happens. Yep, for sure. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, Purdue's pretty darn good. There's no doubt about that. Uh, Fedigator, we had too many key turnovers, like stepping, stepping out of bounds two or three times. Yeah, you can't give Purdue plus four uh, in, in the turnovers. That's not going to help you, um, Derek. And uh, we had one about – Luke Goody, I wanted to get to. I, I can't find the question right now, but somebody asked about Luke Goody going through senior night. He's a junior. He graduated from Geese College of Business in three years. Good for him, man. College basketball player graduating from one of the best business schools in, in the country in, in three years. Did you take anything away from that, Derek? Yeah, I mean, all, all of us are – the antenna is going to go up if somebody's yeah. going through through that, and especially somebody who's maybe not having the, the close of the year 
that that we expect. I mean, he was really good the first couple of months, but his role has definitely gone down here the last month or so. It raises your eyebrows for sure because you just don't often yeah. see guys that aren't seniors going through senior night. Um, it is a great accomplishment, so he certainly deserves the round of applause he got. But usually, you know, when you get the jersey and a plaque type of thing or whatever you call it, that um, and, and you still have eligibility, that probably makes people wonder. So. But Tara um, Shannon's got two of them now. Did Coleman go? I don't think Coleman went through it. No. But a couple uh, of these guys in these COVID years, Derek. Hasn't Kofi been through two? Io went through yeah. two, I think. Yeah. Um, so that there, there are guys that have done it. But certainly, as you've seen Luke's role just shrink down the stretch of this season, yeah. uh, it makes you wonder. Um, but there, there are just – so many questions with this roster going into next year. He could play, he'd come back and play a big role potentially, but I do think Illinois would recruit heavily at really almost every position outside of maybe the five, although that's up still up in the air. So um, I don't know, but it, it does make you wonder. I think that's, that's definitely fair to speculate. Yeah. All right, Derek, uh, anything else you want to hit on before we get out of here? Um, I mean, I don't think people after tonight probably want to get the old like appreciate where you came from, but uh, it was nice to uh, reminisce a little bit for us. Uh, kind of, you know, we talked about, remember when we covered the UNLV game out at Vegas and the loss of, to New Mexico state at the United center. And I will say like playing being mathematically in the mix for a big 10 title in the last week of the season, like what is it? Three out of the last four years is, something to be said and, and to have this building the way it was um, at Illinois fans deserve a ton of credit. The crushers deserve a ton of credit. I know they've taken some knocks over the year. Um, you know, maybe they're not an elite student fan base in the, in the big 10. I know some have said that, you know, they got a Mackie set a high bar, but tonight was, it was just incredible. So um, hats off, been in a lot of games in this building. And tonight was one of the, one of the most juiced I can remember. It was awesome. Like, uh, take people behind the scenes. Derek and I covered a lot of bad basketball teams. And I kept telling him, we're going to keep doing this, and we're going to cover some great games. And tonight was one of those. And Illinois didn't win, but, like, that atmosphere. Illinois is, along with Purdue, those are the two elite teams in the Big Ten, the two top teams in the Big Ten. And, And there's no question. They've been far better than every team over the last four or five years. Wisconsin's kind of on the fringe of that, though the last couple of years haven't gone very well for them. Michigan State is not in their tier right now. And think about that. We're going to all those games at Michigan State and watching John Gross teams get beat by 25 points on ESPN, Derek. Yep. Um, and just uh, those were just commercials for, for Tom Izzo, right? Like and John Gross's teams are, are just getting crushed there. Um, they've they've come a long way, and but now the expectation is is higher and that, that's what brad underwood has brought and you know you have to wear what happened three years ago in the ncaa tournament that just continues to cloud this and until people get to that second weekend it feels like there's just going to be that that sigh of relief isn't going to happen mm-hmm. until you get to that second weekend of the ncaa tournament and this team is capable of it but by not winning a game like this or marquette or tennessee there's still a huge doubt about whether this can be the team to do that. And I, I think that's, that's fair um, of, of what the new expectation is for Illinois to get there. Cause until you get to that point, everyone nationally is still going to have some questions about your program too. That's fair too. Yeah. Without the, the wins against the ranked teams and, and just still a, a program and, and Brad hasn't been able to advance uh, this this place, Stephen F. Austin, Oklahoma State, obviously tougher at SFA, hasn't advanced the second weekend, so people are going to wonder about that. But I just think it's probably more so boiling down to this team is is really good on paper, uh, offensively is a, is a problem for people, but uh, defense on the whole, they, can they get enough stops when it matters? Uh, can they can they beat really really good teams? They haven't quite yet. There's there's not examples of that. Um, I will say, even though Purdue. First time back-to-back Big Ten champs uh, since 06, 07. Ohio State was the last Big Ten team to do that in terms of outright. Um, they're Remember still wearing – Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. You're they're right. still wearing that that loss last year and kind of the, the cloud of what they still need to do in the tournament too. I mean, um, I know the St. Peter's loss was in the Sweet 16, but they probably feel like that was a squandered chance to go to the Final Four. Of course, they had North Texas. They had, they've had a couple of these recently that um, – 
for as awesome as the regular season that they've had, they're going to, they're going to go in with similar kind of just still hungry feelings from that fan base. Um, once they get into the tournament too. Yeah. Cause Purdue, uh, man, the last three years, Derek, they've lost to a 13 seed, a 15 seed and a 16 seed. I mean, as great as Matt Painter is, and I, I was going to mention, sorry to interrupt you before, but I was going to mention, like, remember when Matt Painter had the A.J. Hammond years? And you remember thinking, like, wait, is this going to go well? Like, are, are they going to bounce back? He's been the best coach in the Big Ten for the last decade, right? Like, after Thad Mata had his dominant run, it's kind of been Izzo and, and Painter. And, you know, to get back-to-back Big Ten titles for them, I mean, Purdue's got, what, 31 uh, in their history, and, and mm-hmm. Matt Painter's starting to accrue them now. Um, it's a hell of a program. I'm, I think they're going to be really good next year with those guards coming back, even though Ed's probably going to the NBA. Uh, I think the rest of the Big Ten is just praying for that day that, that he leaves. But Painter's a, a heck of a coach, but he's still got that. Like, he's still got that gorilla on his back. He the does. whole Big Ten does, really. Yeah, man. It's uh, <laughs> It needs to change. Maybe it's one of those situations where I, I don't know that it's the case. I said it the other day on radio. Like, the year that everybody kind of expects the Big Ten to go quietly and maybe they have one team, that being probably Purdue, to go on in a sustained run that – and they pop up and have like three or four teams in the Sweet 16. Probably won't happen because I couldn't name you um, that third or fourth team. Probably if you, the third would probably be Nebraska. As crazy as that sounds, if you're if you're going to try to do that exercise, but it's probably um, Michigan State because that's yeah. what is those team. Malik Call go on some tear. Tyson Walker go on some tear. That's true. They still that five spot is just can't get over it. Um, I can't I can't I can't believe he went to a season. With that, like, and not just go, like, just ride with Xavier Booker early in the season, ride with it, five star, figure it out. Anyway, that's topic for another day because yeah. otherwise that team could have been great. Yeah. But, you know, Matt Painter on that note is, is a final four run from being really nationally considered as, as one of the best, even though I think that people in Big Ten country probably already put him close to that, if not in there. Um, but then also Brad, if, if Brad makes it, Deep into the deep into the second weekend or into the final four, he he elevates into a a pretty nice echelon, I think, um, because the regular season numbers and the seeds that Illinois has gotten and and how he turned this thing around at Illinois has all been really really impressive. It's just the the run that is kind of the the void. Yeah. All right. That'll do it for Derek Piper and I. Thanks to more than 300 plus that were on the live YouTube channel. Appreciate all you guys hit the like button on the way out, subscribe to us, hit the notifications bell. If you're listening on the podcast, give us a follow rating review wherever you get your podcast. We really appreciate that. We'll have plenty more at Alina inquire. I, I, I can't leave Derek without if for Zach Eady, the MVP of the night would have been Myers Leonard, right? Yes. Crushing two beers twice on the video board uh did his best david bakhtiari i think he was one of the first ones yeah. to kind of do that the stars were out tonight nick algretti with his three rings I, I went and shook his hand said what's up uh and he had three rings sydney brown was here tonight nick hardy was here tonight uh, i'm not a huge country music fan but brett eldridge and i guess his brother bryce is, is someone I, I should know but they were in attendance tonight we saw kendall gill bruce douglas Stephen Bardo, of course, uh, was here for this. Um, man, Kenny Battles here a lot, but he was here. Like, it was star-studded night, man. A lot of fun. It's cool when you see them put that extra row uh, on the baseline. You know, it's uh, you know a big night. We saw obviously uh, at one point Io and DeRozan sitting over there. Um, so, which was so uh, cool. <laughs> that was insanely cool. But yeah. I mean, Myers living it up back on his his old stomping grounds was was awesome, and, and I think uh, that tells you about the pride that they have in this program, right? That, that it was an event that they had to be here. Yeah. Like Nikki makes the the drive down here, um, and and Myers makes the drive up here. Like it, it that tells you like they're proud of this program and they're they're amped about it. And uh, catching up with some of those guys at halftime was was really cool. Hundred percent, yeah. It's uh, it's something that you you desire. It like. Josh Whitman said not to be too reflective on this podcast because, you know, I lost the game and there's still a lot to, to play for. But, you know, Josh was talking about uh, when he hired Brad that, you know, it used to be an event to come to, you know, State Farm Center and uh, it was special uh, 
for the games here and, and all the stakes and everything. And tonight had the stakes and the attraction and it brought some of those stars out. And uh, let's not have Myers Leonard be the only one who's chugging beers on the video board. That's a challenge to anybody else. Maybe not the kid who does the dances because he's a little too young. But uh, other than that, let's uh, let's see if anybody can match that. I'm trying to think. Like, there's a lot of linemen I think could kill that. <laughs> I, I love the guy Alex Palczewski could crush it. Like <laughs> I'm sure Nick Allegretti could do it too, but Alex Palczewski's the guy I think number one seed for me. And I'm trying I to like think that. of basketball guys. Mm. I, would Georgie be taking down some like? I don't know if he's a beer guy. I don't know that either. Is he drinking wine? He probably doesn't. He doesn't need alcohol to liven him <laughs> yeah, up. Right. <laughs> Uh, he's guy. A he's a guy who comes to mind. Mm. But yeah, anyway, Alex Pochessi's the guy. That... <laughs> I'm sure Kofi could do some work. I would imagine. <laughs> right. But Myers would not surprise me um, that, that he he'd be that guy too. So it was it was just a cool crowd. But thanks everybody for listening. Uh, we appreciate you guys. with plenty coming up at IlliniInquire.com. Everybody have a great day. Take care of each other. We'll talk to you next time on the Illini Inquire podcast.